Those of you that know I had some surgery, thank you for your prayers. Recovery is coming along just fine. Um, I think we're well ahead of schedule, or schedule, if you have a K in it. So uh, we're, we're good. A uh, couple things very, very quickly. One is that we are challenging you, and we put this in a newsletter, but we're aware that some of you don't get it. If you'd like to get it, just send us a note at info at rsafeharbor.com. We do not bombard you. You get one thing from us a week. But in the newsletter, we're asking you to, to work with the Spirit of God this week and to bless somebody with $17. It's an odd number. We wanted it to be. We wanted to make it stick in there and make you wonder why 17. Uh, not $17.31, just 17. Now, here's the thing. If you don't have the money, well, then you don't have to do this. If you want to get together, maybe you're college students and you don't have enough money for a down payment on a free meal. We get that. But you might be able to pull 20 or 30 of you and come up with some change. This is not so that you can then get them to watch our safe harbor. This is not so that you can get them into the baptistry. This is to get into the practice of intentionally looking for a way to bless people. And if they ask you why, just smile and say, Jesus loves you. Let it go from there. Let the spirit take it from there. You don't have to have a script. You don't have to worry. And by the way, if you get all tongue-tied and can't say Jesus loves you, just smile at them and walk away. They'll get it. They'll get it. But then, and this is really important, if you can, if you are willing, email us the story. If it worked out great, if it didn't work out at all, it, we, would, we want to share stories um, among the staff. But if you don't want them shared publicly, tell us, we won't. And if you say you can share it, but you know, blur the names, we'll do that too, all right? And those stories would also come at info at rsafeharbor.com. So bless somebody intentionally, you can do this. And also, if you live in the local area, we would love to have you come be a part of our Brentwood House Church, which is really what this is. This isn't the mother church. This isn't uh, the boss church and all the other ones are out there. Are kind of, no, we are a network of house churches. But if you're in the Nashville area, we would love to have you visit so we could train you how to do some of the different behind-the-scenes jobs so that the people that are doing it now are not trapped forever in a tunnel and pit from which they will never escape. You know, we, we would like to have backup, all right? So we won't trap you either. We're just looking for people who will come participate behind the scenes or in front of the camera, either one. Let's talk. Through January... Uh, we set up the history of how the church has grown and why it has not grown sometimes. Why we had some spectacular failures and why when the day of Pentecost came and so many thousands were baptized and shortly after another 5,000, why that wasn't normative after that. That in fact you run into all kinds of problems and trials and then when Rome grabs control of things it shuts down the growth of the faith except in a very isolated part in the far north. We've talked about that. This is the lesson five, so please go back and catch up. This, will, this sermon will not have as much history in it, but there is something that we need to really grasp. Before I get there, I've told you before a story about killer chihuahuas and their backup, so I'm not going to tell that story. But I will bring, and if you don't know that story, where have you been? We've been right here. Anyway, or actually, we've been everywhere recorded, but you get the point. I had, growing up in my years, a poster on my wall. Everybody did. I didn't have Ferret Fawcett because I, I had rules in my family. But I had this huge culvert, and uh, that's a water pipe under a road or something. And there on the bottom was this tiny wee duck, duckling, actually. And underneath it said, Arise, go forth, and conquer. Because a lot of times in the morning, I felt like that wee duckling, and uh, the irony of the poster appealed to me. I've never been a physically imposing individual, and I'm not overburdened with gifts and abilities. I like to tell people that like ne uh, Liam Neeson, I have a specific set of skills, but they're not the same. <laughs> they're, they're, they're much more narrowly focused and less physically able. So the poster really summed up my passage through each day. We've seen evidence in scripture and in our lives that God can take our scraps and he can feed 5,000. 
He can take a phone on a tripod and start our safe harbor, growing to thousands all over the world, literally, and well over 30 nations. And yet, we're still hesitant. And yet, we're still, we still doubt that God could use our abilities. Maybe we're not even aware of what they are. I will tell you this, 90% of all the use of an ability is merely showing up with your eyes open. Walking into the store with your eyes open. Eating out with your eyes open. Looking about. That will get you where God needs you to go because God's very good at this. He's going to get you where you need to be. You might be surprised, however, that if you doubt, if you fear, if you're not sure how this could possibly work, how God could possibly take your scraps and feed 5,000, you might be surprised and very pleased to know that there's a book in the Bible that tells you exactly how this works and even shows you when and why it doesn't and proves to us that sometimes when it doesn't work, it's because we're doing the right thing. As Job found out, sometimes when all hell breaks loose, it's because you're doing the right thing. Remember that. Earthly success is not a barometer of God's pleasure with how you're going through your day. The book of Acts is often in mind as a, rule, a source of rules in worship, behavior, the, it, it, but that's not what it is. It just isn't. It is a book telling us what it was like for those first pioneers of faith as they took the new reality they had encountered, the risen Lord, and then tried to apply it to their life, to be faithful to what now they knew to be true. And sometimes it worked, and sometimes it didn't, and sometimes it was wonderful, and sometimes it was tragic. The book of Acts is history, not prescription. Underline that in your brain. It is history, not prescription. They tried different things in different areas. In fact, the entire New Testament, they tried different things in different areas. Take a look at Paul's uh, instructions to Timothy and Titus about who should be elders or leaders in their community. And you find in Timothy, he always liked to send him to nice places. So he said they must have believing children. Titus, Titus must have been a gunslinger because he sent him to horrible places. When he sent him to Crete, uh, he even said, you've heard it said that all Cretans are drunkards, gluttons, and liars, and that's true. And I'm going, Paul, you can't. That's a broad brush there, Paul. But when he talks to Titus about uh, these leaders in the community, he says their children must not be accused of riot. They're two different standards because you're trying to apply Christ in two different cultures and his wildly different culture. So this is history, not prescription. The book of Acts is volume two of Luke's masterwork on Christ and his effect upon the next generation. He was a historian, he was a physician, he was an artist. More is known about him than the average apostle, and Luke was not an apostle. He had keen observational skills, and he also had people skills. For example, when you read his gospel, he is, that's the only one you're going to find out what Mary was thinking when the angel spoke to her. How did he do that? Interviewing Mary. Luke was very amazing in his skill and precision in recording what he heard and he gave us an amazing account of the life of Christ and then how Christianity spread. It's kind of fun to do this if you've not done this before. The book of Acts is not a long book. You know, you, you can really get through it in a couple of hours if you're rushing through. But if you spend a week, let's say, just mining it for pronouns, you will see when Luke joins Paul and when he doesn't by when he changes us to they. You'll find he, he weaves himself in the story because he was there. And he's a, he's a reporter of history from the birth of Christ to the ascension. And now what? The early church. So, saying that, the first five verses of the book of Acts, it, we, we miss this. We really do miss this because we, um, we're so far removed from the story, he writes, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about what Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them, gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. 
On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave, this, gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me talk about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We, we read that and go, <laughs> when they heard that, forks would have dropped. I don't know they had forks. Probably didn't. Bread would have dropped. Their jaws would have dropped. They would have looked at each other. There would have been um, a frisson of excitement, but there would also have been quite a bit of horror, terror. They would not have slept very well. It would have rattled them. It would have kept them up at night. They were, they were faithful Jews. They knew what it meant in the past when the Holy Spirit showed up. Think of this. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Bereshit para Elohim, in the beginning God, and it's a plural word, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Boom, they're there. God made them. Got to be perfect, got to be good, right? God made them. Next line, however, is that the earth is full of chaos and storms and water and wind and it's dark. And then the Holy Spirit comes. And the Holy Spirit comes upon the planet and order begins to come out of chaos and disorder. Moses is trying to lead the people of Israel, but Moses had a few handicaps. One, one person can't lead that many people who don't even know him, and you can't talk to them all at the same time. Can't send them a group text, uh, because this is before any technology, uh, except like the wheel. So it is hard to really harness this. And disorder was growing, grumbling was growing, and God said, I'm going to help you, Moses, lead by giving you people. And we're always asking for people to be at the soundstage, to send us videos, like the one you saw today from Josh Turner, who I call my son and he calls me father, and we have for a long time, and there's a story behind that. Couldn't be more proud of Josh. I would, I would grow a beard to be like him, but I have no follicles on the side. So this is it. This is it. This is the sum total of beardage of which I'm capable. Beardage is a word. I, ju I just wordicated it. But God comes upon Moses and says, let me give you people. And the Holy Spirit falls on these men. And they, the apostles know what happens next. We always see him in the background. Uh, in John chapter 3, verse 8, in the King James, it goes, the, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell from whence it came and whither it goes. So is everyone born of the Spirit if we want to put that in modern language, which many versions do, and they do a good job of it, the wind goes where it wants to go. And nobody can tell why or when. If you're thinking, well, the weather guys, they didn't have weather guys, hush. He says, but everyone that's born of the Spirit moves like that. You don't know where they're going. You don't know where, where they came from. You don't know what's going to happen. That's us. If the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he will probably, he will almost certainly not shove you out front and center, but use you in the background to make fundamental changes slowly, very slowly. You probably won't see the fruit of your labor. I've had people send me emails for the last 30, 40 years, telling, thanking me for being responsible for their salvation because, and long before there was an online. They'll say that they heard me here or that the, whatever I said to them there, and I'll look, look at my wife and I'll say, I have no clue who this person is. I had no idea this was going on. You see, if, it's not like accident. You just be Christian, filled with the Spirit, things are going to happen. You may not see them. You may not know them. You may never get one of those emails to encourage you, which is a shame because those things are great. But trust God that he's doing with your loaves and fishes what needs to be done. I mean, the birth of, the, of, of Jesus Christ was accomplished by the Holy Spirit, for goodness sake. That's, a, that's something. That's an amazing miracle. Jesus said he cast out um, demons by the power of the Holy Spirit in Matthew chapter 12. In, in Luke chapter 1, again, the birth, the choosing of Mary, all of this. And so whenever you're an apostle, and he looks at you and goes, you need to get to Jerusalem because if you wait there, the Holy Spirit is coming and he's going to fill you and take control. You're going, I don't know about this. Oh, you're going to go. 
Because as Jonah showed, running away from God ends poorly. Back before his arrest and crucifixion, Jesus warned his apostles that he would be leaving them, and that upset them, of course. They were confused. They were fearful, even. Maybe even a little bit angry. I don't know. Disappointed, certainly. But he promised them a comforter. Now, here's another devotion. If you don't want to go through uh, the book of Acts this week looking for pronouns, and I understand that that's not as exciting for some people as it might be for me, uh, because you, you have that condition. You have that a life. Uh, so I understand. But you might want to read John chapters 14, 15, and 16. Now, that's not chapter 14 with these verses. No, it's three chapters, John 14, 15, and 16. It is all about the comforter. You're going to receive the comforter, the paraclete in, other ter- uh, in the Greek language, which means one who's going to walk alongside you, share your burdens, and keep you in the right direction. And so just to pull a few verses out, John 14, 16, and um, 17, I think that'd be a good place to go. Uh, I'll ask the Father, he'll give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. And you heard the rest of that this morning. So let's skip forward to chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. When the advocate comes, whom I'll send to you, I'll send to you from the Father. I'll get that out. The spirit of truth who goes out from the Father He will testify about me. So when we get the Holy Spirit, we're going to be testifying about Christ somehow, some way. Chapter 16, a bit longer. Let's do this. Verses 6 through 14. Um, Rather, you are filled with grief because I've said these things, but very truly I tell you, it's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go... I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and about righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Now, there's a whole lot of twists and turns in that language, so I hope you go and look at the chapters. Here's the point. God is with you now. And here's here's a really biggie, and I, I hope that I can get this through to you. The hardest thing in the world is to move from here to hear. Now, if you're on a podcast that's not our, our new video uh, version of it, to move it from your head to your heart. Your head can be convinced of a fact, but unless your heart believes it, it's hard to get action. Well, God tells you, you got you got something in you which is greater than you and which will not leave you. Now, I stress that because I can remember as a boy... My, my father, we were driving past somewhere, and I saw this low-slung building with dark, you know, blacked-out windows and a few neon signs. And I asked him what that was, and he said, that's a bar. And I said, what are they doing there? And he says, they drink garbage. And, you know, he, he's, and, and he said, you never want to go in there. And, and because, I, I said, why? I learned early, don't do that, but I said, why? And he said, because the Holy Spirit is with us, and the Holy Spirit won't go in there. So you don't want to go where the Holy Spirit doesn't go. He meant, well, Holy Spirit doesn't park himself at the curb. You want to go into a dark place and do something good? He's with you. He's with you when you want to do something bad. That's why the Bible says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say, don't leave him in the car. He stays with us. Let's help him cheer. Whenever in Luke 3, 16, the scripture tells us that You know, John the Baptist knew the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit was descending upon the Son of God. So now the apostles know that this is going to happen to them and it's rather terrifying. Of course it is. It's exciting but terrifying. Now next week, we're going to go into detail about how the Spirit works in and through us. But for now, we're just going to go over some basic facts. They are facts. And facts and reality trump any thoughts and feelings we might have, period. 
There was a man in Florida who had made it through several hurricanes without ever getting hurt, and he decided that all these weather idiots, uh, you know, standing out there until they're, you're, they're finally pulled inside to the safety of their big vans or something, just were trying to scare people. So to prove it, during one of the major ones that later wrecked Homewood, Florida, he had himself almost like Ulysses tied to the mast. If you don't know that, you know, read books, they're really cool. Um, facing the water on a pier to show that water and wind can't hurt you. And you know what? He's right. It's what's in the water, like houses that hurt you. He was never seen again because something that was in the wind and the water hit him. You can have all the feelings you want to have, but that doesn't mean that they're facts. So we're going to talk about some facts. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. We always know that repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. What's the next line? And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, language is a funny thing. It doesn't say you'll receive gifts of the Holy Spirit. And there are certain miraculous gifts that were sometimes given by the Spirit. And there are other times that, no, the gift is the person of the Spirit. The greatest gift I've received in my life, other than the presence of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in my life, is the gift of my wife. What are we saying whenever we ask somebody to marry us? Or in our, our situation, when Cammy tells me we're getting married. The, <laughs> just, just go with it. Just go with it. And if somebody has a right home, I would like... Let's move on. The greatest... What, what are we saying? We, say, we are saying, I want to be your gift and for you to be my gift. Presence through the ages. I've never been a big John Lennon fan, but one of his lesser known songs that's only sung at weddings is Grow Old Along With Me, The Best Is Yet To Be. He, he did good on that one. Uh, and he can imagine there's no heaven or hell, but that's feelings, not facts. But this idea of being with God. So who do we have when the Holy Spirit shows up? We have the most mysterious member of the Godhead or the Trinity. Francis Chan even wrote a book called The Forgotten God. Uh, a good book, but great title. Because we often don't talk about him. No other religion has anything like this. Period. This is one of the things that just blew C.S. Lewis's mind. And he wrote about it frequently. But no Muslim, no Hindu, no Taoism, Confucianism, no Norse, you know, Norse sagas. And none of these have anything like this. They all have gods. And many of them have sons and daughters of gods. No Holy Spirit. In older English versions, he was called the Holy Ghost. When we hear ghost, we, hear of a, we think of a haunting presence of a dead person, maybe in, like in Dickens' A Christmas Carol, in which they were called spirits, not ghosts, but I, I've become pedantic, evidently, when I point this out. The Holy Ghost, the word ghost back then meant guest. He, not a woo, but a guest. He is the guest in our lives as a representative of who we are now, or a testament of who we are now. We're told he seals us in that, that relationship. There's more, and we're going to go over those rather quickly now. And there are a lot of scriptures involved, but I'm going to ask you to you know, give us grace that we're moving quickly through, and to remember that we have the notes. It's in the description of the video on our YouTube page. If you've not subscribed there, we're only 1,200 away from 4,000 subscribers. And if we can get those, it bumps up in the search results. Uh, it makes it much easier for people to find all of our stuff the more people that subscribe. It's just one of their things, all right? And by the way, if ever an ad pops up, we have no control over that. We're not monetized. And since they're the only game in town, they can put stuff up, all right? Sorry. Does the Holy Spirit come to you? What if you've not even been baptized yet? First of all, you should be. Write us, info at rsafeharbor.com and say, this is where I live, I'd like to be baptized. If we can't get to you, somebody we know can. Because baptism's important. But what if you're not baptized yet? Well, in, in scripture, yes, he can come to you. He did, did that to the household of Cornelius, if you remember. They showed signs of being filled with the Holy Spirit even before baptism. Remember, we don't get to say where he goes or where he doesn't. The Holy Spirit goes. In fact, 
I would love to know a lot more about this, but I have no intention of sitting Jesus down and grilling him when I get there. I don't want to annoy anybody when I get to heaven in case maybe they'll check to see if there's an administrative error. So I'm not asking questions. But the Bible says the Holy Spirit knows the secret things of God. Other versions say the deep things. So maybe we should get rid of some of our hubris when we act like we know. Growing up in a tribe in which I grew up, I grew up in the far conservative wing of it, and we got a new songbook. We would have a special time after Sunday night services to X out and change songs and lyrics and such to make them more scriptural. And one of them was, I know whom I have believed. First of all, thank you for the whom, well placed, well played. I know whom I have believed. There's a line in there, I know not how the Spirit moves convicting men of sin. We had to change it to, I know just how the Spirit moves, because all the Spirit did was inspire the Bible and then evidently retire, um, maybe to Florida home of the newlywed and nearly dead, so, you know, it just seems natural. Um, and all of us have a black book, and that's all. No, what hubris that was. We don't know how the Spirit moves. That was something they told us. So once again, who do we have as a guest in our life? Well, briefly, and it looks like, I, I told them I was only going to go 27 minutes to get, and they, and they believed, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Watching their little faces fall is such fun. This will be rapid. Romans 8, 2, he is the spirit that lives in us. This is not if, 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 if. This is now. Move this from head to heart. He is the spirit of grace. Hebrews 10, 29. Ephesians 1, verses 14 and 17. We could have pulled some others out. He is the spirit of wisdom and revelation. You're wiser than you realize. You know more than you think. When you speak, perhaps he is who they will hear. Romans 5, 8, 15 and 16, the adoption, his spirit of adoption. You're in a new family now. You may not feel like you're one of us, but you are because we're all his children. Back to Romans 8, 2, the spirit of life. I wasn't afraid of going into surgery. I told God, either let this fix me or throw the switch and take me. I don't want to be back here three or four times. You know, these are my two. I have a very binary choice here. Uh, I don't know that God's going to answer that prayer for me the way I want it answered, but I wasn't afraid if he threw the switch because I'm not dead. We don't die. Our bodies fall over, and really, at a, there comes a particular time we're quite happy to park them. Spirit of life. And then the spirit, I love this one, 2 Timothy 1, 7. Memorize that one. He is a spirit of love, power, and self-discipline. You can do it. You've already got the power. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is resident in you when you are baptized into Christ. When we read or pre preach Acts 2.38, we often stress the forgiveness of sins, and so we should. I have sins that I'm really glad got forgiven. How about you? But we should not overlook the precious gift of the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit gave the early church power to share their goods and lives with others. We'll talk more about that in coming Sundays in chapter 2, chapter 4, how they just shared what they had, as if they, the possessions no longer possessed them. They stood up to secular authorities. I love it in chapter 4, whenever the high court says to Peter and John, don't preach anymore in his name, and Peter goes, you know, whether we should preach in his name or not, and you got this opinion, cool, you got that opinion, but we're going to go ahead and do it. I love that. And then in chapter 5, verses 29 and, uh, through 32, once again, they say, you know, you can do what you want to do. We're going to do this because the Holy Spirit told us to do it. It has a power to turn the heart of a zealot and a hater like Paul in chapter 9 into an apostle of Christ. A power to end 1,500 years of prejudice and bigotry in chapter 10 so that Jews and Gentiles now are in the same family power to go anywhere, anytime, and speak of God, and now he remains in you. Yeah, over time, but I'll do this, and we'll close. Um, we'll pull out a song here, and I'm going to talk about the song before we do that, too, because I need your help. <laughs> I'll tell you why in a bit. I'm still trying to find Corinthians. There it is. It's in the New Testament. Pfft, who knew? Oh, that, that's 1 Corinthians. That would be the wrong one. It's a good book, mind you, but not the one I want today. 
2 uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 4, 4 through 11. The God of this age, listen carefully, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. We ourselves are servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness, remember the arrival of the Holy Spirit, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, that's body, your body, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry in, around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. That last passage might concern you a wee bit, but all it means is every day, a little bit less of us, a little bit more Jesus shines. How could that be a bad thing? How could that be a bad thing? Since I've already gone over, I'll tell you one story, then we'll go to the song. I preached the world's worst sermon. It was awful. That was a lead turkey that wasn't going to fly. I knew it about eight minutes in. I knew that all my study had come up with the world's worst sermon. I even went back, tried to repeat a couple points just to see if I could salvage it. And when I realized I couldn't, I just quit. Stepped down. In this church, they would, everybody that went step, would stand up and sing a song they called a song of invitation. So that if somebody had been touched by the service or by the hand of God somehow, they'd come forward to be baptized or you know, repent of sins or the like. The lady came forward. She sat on the front pew. and My first thought was, what are you doing here? But I, I went and sat beside her, and I asked the question I always ask, which is, what can I do for you? Um, and she goes, I want to be baptized. <sighs> Should have left it there. Um, couldn't. I leaned over, and I said, why? She thought I was quizzing. So she you know, told me the why. The why was good. But I said, um, when did you decide that you want to be baptized? She said, oh, your lesson. What part? And, and she told me this beautiful thing that I didn't say. <laughs> Sometimes we need to remember, you just show up. Let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit's going to do.